Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Tennis Files podcast. I'm here with my friend Jonas Erickson. Uh, Jonas, it's really a pleasure to connect with you. As I was mentioning before, I hit the record button because I've seen so many of your videos. It's been, you know, searching for the right racket and strings, and you're one of the first people that I watch. So um, it's really cool to to see you grow. And I also love reading your articles as well. So I've re- uh, read a lot of them too. So um, Jonas, thanks so much for coming on to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to be on the other side of a podcast, so <laughs> I do enjoy yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. People should also check out your podcast uh, on YouTube. I've, I've seen some some nice ones there as well. I think you're, you've are you done, what, like 60 of them so far-ish? or something Yeah, like I, I wish I knew. I mean, it's maybe close <laughs> to 100. I don't know, but it's like oh. it's, it, it goes in spurts, but I haven't been as prolific as you, so it's like a thing that... If you get some good guests, you know, you keep on going. But then sometimes you're like, oh, you get pressed for time. And then you're like, oh, shit, I have to find new guests. <laughs> <You> know, <so. laughs> yeah, yes. man, it's 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 not easy, as you know. So but yeah, um, again, you know, really great to have you here, um, you know, to, to just talk uh, tennis rackets, strings and other equipment, perhaps if we have time, we'll see. But um, I do find it interesting to see like the the journey, the racket journey of, of folks um, on occasion when they're tennis ex- uh, equipment experts like yourself. So I was curious, like what rackets you use, like from the junior days, did you use some sort of like stainless steel or, or metal frame or what? What, what, what were, did you use throughout the years? Yeah, I mean, I'm not that old, but I'm quite, quite old. <laughs> but it's, uh, <laughs> no, it's I, I used uh, like my first proper racket was a Wilson 6195. That's nice. still around, like you can still buy it, but in different iterations over the years, right? But it was the the red and white one. I think Federer made it more famous with his Pro Staff 90. That's kind of like this polka dot kind of paint job, right? And uh, yeah. that's a great one. I, I There's plenty of pros still using this mold today. I think Evans is using that exact frame, kind of the, the layup is what's inside the racket. The mold is the structure of the racket. Mm-hmm. And so there's several pros using that, but with different cosmetics on them, right? I see. I see. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I've the the first record I remember that I was successful with um was the uh the hammer, I think six point two, like the skunk that like uh yeah, Martin used, uh Todd Martin and was it uh Davenport as well. So that's pretty nice. But um cool, cool, awesome. And uh, you know, I, I do want this obviously this podcast to be very helpful for for folks in terms of like finding the right racket and so we're going to get into that first i think so like what is your process jonas of fig- you know from step zero i guess or whatever step one like what what is the first step you do to like figure out the right racket for you and then obviously you can go on to the other steps yeah i think it's you have to start always looking at yourself like figuring out like who you are what you do well what you do less well where your strengths and where your weaknesses are like if you have a you know problem in in overhitting or if you're more like you can't get enough power on your shots you usually get like put pulled back and have to always defend you know so you you have to be take a pretty strong look at yourself in the mirror to find a good racket i i always recommend people to record themselves i've been doing it for many years through my youtube channel and stuff it's sometimes gruesome watching and you're not going to like what you see but it's also a way to improve not only with the racket but also kind of your technique and your movement and you're seeing what's going wrong if your opponent allows, maybe you play like tournament or league matches, you can record yourself in the match. And, and then you can look back and say, oh, what was what was I doing at like 30, 40, you know, in, in three service games, I made the same mistake and so on. Uh, so kind of based on your, you know, level, of course, like you shouldn't use too much of an advanced racket, but you also have to ask yourself, I think, first of all, like, why do you play tennis? So if you play tennis to win matches, to be competitive and to improve, the racket should ideally help you a bit, you know, like unless you're a, pro that needs ultimate control and you need to play with a pretty heavy frame i think a lot of players that play tennis for a while but they're not on like such a high level i think they're using quite difficult rackets so then modern rackets 100 square inch or even larger head sizes is the way to go you know Uh, but if you're an advanced player that require control and feel then it's more of a difficult process to get like you accustomed to the field because what we talked about before you we started recording as well is like if you have a racket you really like and you like the feel of it, you like how it, you know, impacts the ball and, and everything. It's quite tough, even on with an updated model, to find that exact thing you're looking for. Uh, so sometimes it's it's tough to make a change. And you see that with rec players, you see that with pros, you know. So, um, but I think you start looking at yourself. Do I need more power? Go bigger head size, go for something more forgiving. Or do you really like like the old school, more control rackets? You know, then there's 
definitely lots of choose from there. So the problem is obviously the choice in the marketplace because whether you, whatever player you are, you're gonna have a, a jungle to wade through in terms of all the types <laughs> of rackets you you like, you know, or want to get trying. Freaking jungle, man! I've gone through I think like twelve so far and haven't haven't decided yet. But um, yeah, a lot of follow ups from that great info, Jonas. I mean, the first one, which one should I pick? Uh, probably let's go with. Um, you, you mentioned uh, the recording. So uh, just a quick like detour, I guess, like that is so important. And I, I record myself and I like you said, I find things that I didn't think was, you know, I do incorrectly. And it's it's so insightful. Um, what do you use to record? I just use my iPhone like I have two iPhones. I have one for phone calls and one for like tennis recording. So nice, it's nice. been working well. I think you can be very picky and use like, a, you know, a 4K camera and stuff. I've tried it in the past, but it's also if, if the ball hits it or it falls because of the windy conditions or something, it's <laughs> going to be, you know, more expensive and it's going to break easier than an iPhone. An iPhone can actually take a fall. So uh, that, that also helps. And it records awesome quality and you can use it to yeah. call. So there's a lot of things th that is good there. But you can use a GoPro as well. I Probably there's a bit cheaper alternative or whatever smartphone that has recording. And yeah. if you don't want to edit your videos, you can use kind of Swing Vision, which is a tool that kind of cuts out. I mean, it does many things. You can analyze like your speed and stuff, but it cuts out the dead time. So you don't have to sit there. And if you play a match, you like have to actually edit out all the walking and picking up the balls and swearing or whatever is happening <laughs> in between the points, you know. So uh, there are things that you can make it pretty easy. So you always make sure to record your sessions. And I think uh, I can really recommend that to anyone, really. Yeah, hundred percent. Love that. And um, and then like to to prop your phone up, are you using like a some sort of tripod or something that attached to the fence or something? Yeah, you can use like a, a fence mount, depending if there's a fence there. I guess in the U.S. there's a lot of like always a fence around a tennis court. Uh, I've lived in Malta in south of you know um, Europe, and now I live in Spain, south of Spain, and mm. it's not always like a proper fence where you can actually mount uh -huh. it on the fence. So then I always bring a tripod and get a semi sturdy one i mean you can get that cheap like amazon basics one which i have sure I um, too. that's easy to pack in the bag you just put it up people will ask you why you're filming but that <laughs> that's a part of the game you know you always get that like yeah. oh you what, what are you filming what, what are you doing and you know so it's, it's you're gonna get that question but otherwise it's great great way to to record yeah awesome awesome jonas and then before i ask you about this like the next step um, you did mention, you know, that a lot of people are using rackets that are too heavy for them. Um, you know, you're just like a foro and you're using the the fetter heaviest one or whatever um, frame. So, yeah, well, what are what are some of the biggest racket mistakes that like you're looking around and seeing people make? Yeah, I think it's um, partly using a racket that's too demanding. Like I and also yeah. I see people who they know maybe that if you add lead tape, like weight, it could be tungsten tape or lead tape to a racket, yeah. it's gonna increase power and stability. But what happens is that they overdo it. So you're like, you have a lead tape slapped all over the racket and it's like too heavy and it might impact your swing and then it's gonna hurt your elbow. So I mean, like you need to find a racket where you, that helps you hit the sweet spot as often as possible, especially if you have elbow issues. So I think a lot of players, they they maybe hit sometimes outside or too frequently outside and that's really where the problem with the elbow and stuff happens because then you have a lot of vibrations going down to your arm so the weight i see people using too heavy rackets and in some cases there can be also too light uh that you you're never prog mm. progressing up to a slightly heavier racket you're using maybe 270 grams which is kind of like the ultra light racket type and you have no stability, you know, no power really, and no stability on the ball, and that can also be bad for your game, right? So, so the light, the weight is is something I see quite quite a lot, you know, that people use use the wrong weight. Then the second one, which is more related to strings, is that they string the racket too high. So, mm. old tensions like from the '90s used to be that you know, everybody played with like a, a softer string, multi-filament or gut, and they knew know that to get control with that, you need to string like. 60 pounds 62 pounds or even more uh, and in this case when you're using now modern polyester strings which has a lot more give and a lot more resilience uh, they you can go down really low you can go down to 25 pounds as manarino one of the videos i made there we got uh, got pretty interesting because he he plays with such a low tension that's that's crazy you get a lot of trampoline from the string bed and if you can control it it's great but it's going to be tough but if you're playing with 45 pounds, for example, that's still low and, and gives you a bit more bigger sweet spot, a bit more power, a bit more depth on your shots. 
and is a bit more forgiving on the arm as well. So I think a lot of players, they stick to that thought that they need to string very, very high tensions to get control. Uh, while I, I don't think that's always the, the best idea. You're seeing it with the pros, they're definitely going down. So I think also club level players should, should consider that going down in tension. Yeah, I know. It's such great advice. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I started with like the 62 or so. I remember back in the day when I was using synthetic gut. Um, and then, you know, as I, I got to poly, then I, I started with like maybe 55, 54. Now I'm down to like 50. So it definitely, um, it's, it's helped to lower, lower the tension and get more out of the string there. Um, especially with the poly. So, so Jonas, so we've established what you've established. The, uh, the first step is uh, of finding a racket is to like really figure yourself out, you know, record yourself and see like, what might I need? You know, what's my game like? So then once we've, we've thought all this out, maybe we've written it down or thought about it, like what, what's the next step that we should take? Yeah. So then hopefully you have an idea of, of who you are. So, you know, like, okay, the level, um, obviously you should go and read articles on tennis nerd or other websites oh, yeah. reviewing rackets, you know, um, that's, that's, there are many out there now, many, many reviewers testing rackets, um, uh, but there should be some kind of range. Like, so if you know, like most players can play with a hundred square inch racket. So there are mainly two popular head sizes today. It's like 98, which is the more control group. There are smaller ones still like 95, but they're getting rarer and rarer. And for most people, nothing even to consider. So if you're a pretty advanced player or you like to go for control, no matter what your level, the 98 is the way to go, you know? And, uh, but then with a hundred, it's such a wide variety. So, there are rackets that fall in between that most players can use, like a speed, for example, or a blade hundred. You know, those kind of mm -hmm. rackets that it's not too powerful, not too spin oriented, where the ball just kicks up or, or has a lot of like launch on your shots. Uh, so you don't need to really go crazy and like try to try everything. Uh, but if you identify, for example, okay, I should probably play with a somewhat forgiving racket, but I don't want it too powerful, then you can go to your favorite retailer or your shop or whatever and and hopefully get a demo because everybody needs to try the racket I, I really suggest you should if you can get four rackets from mm. a demo program tennis warehouse whatever and and try them out because otherwise it can be like you buy something and you're like okay this this does not feel right depends a bit of picky of how picky you are but for some it, it might be like lead to this endless search you know a complete jungle where you're like you're never happy you know because you try too much and that's, and cool. that's where you see a lot <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right here, this guy. Um, yeah, yeah, no, that's that's great stuff. Um, so, in terms of the demoing now, so like, oh, sorry for the beeps. So we we've gotten our four, three or four demos. I think tennis warehouse well, might be three, but yeah, whatever. So then we have the demos, and then what what should we do now? Because like this is one step like where I have effed up before, where like I just took the rackets like as is and just like use them, and then you know. Then, then the next time I did, I said, wait a minute, maybe I should be, you know, thinking about like <laughs> replacing the strings, like all the same, you know, strings and tension, whatnot. So like, what are, what are, how should we um, do our best practices for demoing? Yeah, that's a good, good point. Because like, I think um, some demo programs, maybe it's not long enough, so you can't restring, but ideally you should test mm. all rackets with the same string. So when I test rackets, I have, since I've been testing hundreds and hundreds of rackets and strings, but I have maybe a few different strings that I know exactly how they will play in a certain racket. So I, I you know, like your arms and muscle memory and, and the sensations are built up, but for, for general testing purposes, it's good to have the same setup. So you know that it's not the string that is like bad, or you're not used to it, or it's screwing something up because the string is really half the racket, at least, you know, yeah. in terms of feel, performance, control, power. So if you have an old string, the racket might feel like a rocket launcher because it lost tension. Or if you have a string you're not enjoying, you know, it might be too stiff, then the racket feels stiff because the string is very stiff. So uh, it's better to that just have your string set up if you have time to do it. Maybe if you string yourself, or if you have a stringer that can say, hey, I want Hyper-G or whatever, 50 pounds on all these or three rackets. Then you bring them to the court. Then I always urge people to don't do only do five minutes per racket because because I, I, what i see a lot is like you pick it up you play to hit Sucks. five shots you're like no 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 i can't play with this this is shit. <laughs> and and you need yeah. to actually however painful at least get an hour of hitting in you know oh, preferably okay. like maybe you do half an hour which doesn't sound like a lot and it's not a lot but at least it gives you something and then you do a half an hour the next day or the next time you play because 
you might have a bad day. And then the racket is like, oh, everything is shit, you know? But then the next day you have a great day. So you need to kind of right, right. evaluate also, how am I feeling? Is this kind of a, am I being somewhat objective here? Or is it just very subjective reasoning, you know, behind it? So I think it's as try to eliminate as many variables as possible and give the racket time. Because I, the problem with the demo period of one week is that sometimes it takes, you know, a month to get used to a racket. So you need to have a, a little bit of like, mm -hmm. I really like this racket, but I'm not playing perfectly with it or I'm not like, you know, perfectly in tune with it yet. Give it time because it's, it takes time to build up the muscle memory where you're connected to the racket. Sometimes you need to change the string, lower the tension. But usually you need that feeling to make a commitment to it of like, okay, I, I like this. You know, if you don't have that feeling that you like it after half an hour, most likely you're not going to like it after... Mm five hours, I would say. Yeah. So there's so many rackets. You want that first feeling of like, wow, I like this. And then you see after that. Nice, nice. With, with demo programs, I know now you, you know, you get a lot of hookups. I imagine like, you know, you do such a great job and brands want to work with you, but like for the demo programs, like, do you know, do, do they allow extensions? You know, like if you only have a week with three rackets, like, can you just say, Hey, I'll, extended or something like that. I think so. Sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. I think it okay. depends maybe on the, or oh, how, you know, heavy the, the demand is for a certain model. I mean, it depends, but but that that could be a way to go if you're really like, okay, I, I, I want to try this. One way I built up over time so many hours with different rackets is like I've, I've been buying lightly used rackets, testing mm -hmm. them for as long as required, and then selling them again. I mean, it's a hassle. You have to actually like maybe go to the post office if you buy one like on eBay or similar service. You, you try it, but then you have time with it. And you focus on the racket. Oh, it's not for me. Then you can sell it, and you, you're most likely not going to lose a lot of money, right? Like it's it's used rackets, lightly used rackets. They are, you know, maybe a hundred bucks, hundred twenty bucks if it's in very good condition. It's not like a really old racket. Sometimes you're luckier to have it cheaper. You know, it could be a little bit more. But then you can sell it for ten percent lower, or maybe the same, or maybe even higher if you're a good business guy. You know, so yeah, <laughs> I would say that's been my way of, of just testing so much. It's like, okay, I buy these three use sometimes cheap rackets, and then I, you know, sell them on or it's trade sometimes, you know, I have been trading a lot of rackets like, oh, I didn't like this one. Maybe you will like this, you know, so um, that's a way to actually test without having the kind of restrictions of the demo. Mm. Jonas, I think you should bundle your rackets with a free um, racket analysis and then 2x price. Boom. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Well, you could try. But um, yeah, uh, it, that reminds me, you know, of, of um, this one time. Yeah. You, you know, demoing it properly, you said, and giving it enough time, at least. You like, I remember one of the stupidest demos I ever did was um, shout out to my friend Luis. Um, he has a V core. And um, like in the middle of like a doubles practice match, like I was like, oh, Luis, let me use your V core like this for for a game or two. And uh, and then he had lead tape on it, too, and like different strings and tension. I was like, this is the worst record I've ever played with, you know. But then <laughs> months later, I tried the V core again. And I was like, oh, wow, this is like way better. You know, just I mean, it was it was stupid. But just, you know, things like that. People make mistakes sometimes with these rackets, yeah. Jonas. Um, once you so you're demoing, right? You, you know, you you've, you connect with a few rackets, maybe. And then like, well, how do you how do you narrow it down then to the one? Yeah, that's a tough one. But let's say you like two rackets just for the for argument's yeah. sake, you know, and yeah. then maybe you i mean if you have money you can buy them both and then sell one the one you don't like so you have more time right. you know maybe you get an extension i always recommend to play it in some kind of match format like you, uh, if you're a competitive player hopefully yeah. i mean most tennis players are they like to play either with against friends maybe they have a league maybe they have a club matches going or or even tournaments you know you need to test a racket also in competitive setting that might settle the question of whether it's racket a or b because in competitive settings, as we all know, uh, we get tenser, we tense up, we play poorly or better, depending on your mental state, you know, your psyche. Maybe you're like a, you know, a guy who just or girl who performs really, really well in match situations. But for a lot of tennis players, it's the opposite. So you you break down, mm -hmm. your technique starts going, you're tight, and then the racket will tell you a lot. Like you can play with a racket in practice that feels like a million bucks. You're like, I can't miss with this racket. It's like the best racket ever. You go play a match the next day, suddenly, oh, it's too heavy. I can't move it. Yeah. And I'm 10, you know, so uh, we've all been through that, I think. And it, it, that's that's where you have to get some information and see, okay, do I need, and you have to ask yourself, like, is this, you know, is this too heavy for me? Am I, why am I late? Is it because I'm so nervous and not moving? Or is it because I'm using too much of a racket? So I might actually 
be able to get some more balls back or get some more balls, you know, back defensively in play if the racket helps me a bit more, right? So I think that yeah. match statement is the one where you will feel, okay, I'm winning more with this racket. So than racket B, for example. So that's why I'm going to go with it because that's maybe what's most important to you that you you play your best tennis and you and you win some free points, for example. Yeah, I love that piece of advice, Jonas. Yeah, I mean, there was, I can't remember which frame it was that I was testing and like in practice, just hitting from the baseline, like it was felt amazing. I was ta taking big cuts, but then, you know, when I played a set and kind of like running, running for balls, running forehands, especially like I like to use a buggy whip a lot of times. I hit with a lot of spin and, you know, defense, and I just wasn't able to like whip it as much. So like it's little things like that is very important to, uh, to figure out for yourself. Um, so you mentioned something very interesting and like that I've been intimidated by personally. Um, but I have a, a friend, uh, shout out to Chris. Um, but he, um, he's like the master, uh, besides you of like, you know, buying rackets and then like testing them and then selling them. He eats hundreds of times. He's done this, but, um, maybe thousands, but, um, wh what do you, uh, what are some, any other tips in terms of like platform? Like what's the easiest way? Like, do you sell on a particular platform that makes it super easy to do or or you just use many different ones i've used everything pretty much like there was a site called string forum i think it's still around but it's like really oh, old yeah. so maybe you get like a you know security error because it's not https you know that stuff <laughs> yeah. like that I, I think the last time i checked it out so yeah. that was a forum where you could sell and buy and trade uh, i set up a facebook group just for that you know so that people could awesome. like it's, it's twenty five thousand people something and that's where people list a lot of rackets um, I haven't bought anything from there myself, but I, I, I see a lot of buys and trades and, and people are generally pretty honest. I mean, you have to always check. So it's not like some counterfeit pro products or something, but it's, <laughs> it's quite rare. Like these, these people are tennis nerds that buy a bunch of rackets, trade, sell, then buy another bunch of rackets. It's a pretty harmless hobby, but you know, you, it's easy to get it stuck into this, you know, whether you're a collector or you just love to find because it's an eternal quest for that racket, you know, like it's an, you rarely will find the holy grail for your game. You would just keep searching because it's fun as well. So it's a part yeah. of the tennis, you know, like my friend Henrik, who also tests rackets in for the Swedish tennis magazine, he, he says like, sometimes it's not even fun to play or as much fun if I don't have something new to play with, right? Like <laughs> he brings review rackets, he buys something on a forum, you know, it's, it's classic, right? So, uh, so that's what I've been doing um, using, you know, forums, eBay, like they're in every country. Usually there are different buy and sell sites you can use, you know, so like I even gone mm. to like Netherlands, bought like from Marktplatz, which is like the Dutch. I'm not Dutch, you know, I don't speak Dutch, but I, uh. I bought, ah, I found a racket there and then you buy it like Italian sites. I've been everywhere, <laughs> right? <laughs> so oh my God. Um, you can definitely find, you know, if there's a racket out there, you, you will find it. And now that I live in Spain, there's a Spanish, uh. you know, counterpart to that. So. I found some rackets there. So yeah, there's, there's rackets out there online. You will, you will be able to find them if you really want one. <laughs> so nice, nice, nice. Yeah. Racket of You need to set up an AA group for that. Um, yeah. and also, yeah, feel free. Like if you want to send me that Facebook, um, racket group, um, that you, that you configured, I can put it in the show notes page that people can check it out. Yeah. Um, yeah. Awesome. Oh, and then with the counterfeit situation, um, you did say it's rare, but I was just curious. Cause like, I love watches, for example, but like I've been kind of um, a little afraid to get them like secondhand just because of counterfeit issue. But like what um, have you ever run into that? And then like any ways to like protect against like to make sure it's not a counterfeit? It's a tough one. I have never personally had it, you know, or experienced it, but I've had people reach out to me and say, hey, something looks off here, you know, and mm. there are a few, you know, I'm not a super expert, but there's a few telltale signs like anything visual like does the logo look off like is this the wilson logo i mean it says nilsson you shouldn't buy it. <laughs> uh, mm. small things with the font if you are aware of what you're buying so you can be a little bit skeptical i've never experienced mm. it as i said over hundreds and hundreds of racket purchases but i've gotten like emails and and messages like yeah do you think this is legit and and there's been a few times i've said like this looks a bit off you know there's something with the babula logo or yeah. something that's a bit dodgy right so uh, you have to be a little bit cautious, you know, and yeah, yeah. Uh, and there could be like even when you buy things online, maybe have a few conversations so you can trust the guy. I mean, this is a re reputable seller. Sometimes they have reviews like eBay. I think they have reviews for the seller. That makes it easier. Mm. Yeah. If it's someone complete stranger, it's good to actually get a feel for 
uh, if you can trust this person. Sadly, like that's how it is, right? So otherwise, maybe there's no racket showing up or you know how it is. So you have to be a little bit, you don't have to be super suspicious, but you know, think it through and, and try to get a feel for, for what you're buying, right? Great, great stuff, Jonas. Hey, yeah, just you know, on the buying part of it, then, and, and you did mention actually, you know, some tips and whatnot, like, um, but yeah, just any other like when you're buying a racket, like I don't know, should should you look into buying like the previous version if there's not much of a change, and then also like as far as platforms like to get like you know, you mentioned sometimes you just prefer to get it like lightly used or sometimes new, like I don't know, just any thoughts on that buying part. If you want to save money and you're not ultra picky, I would go for the previous model. Because, I mean, when it's time for a release of a new line and the racket companies are in more hurry now, like you need more products on the market. Yeah. The, the times in between updates are shorter mm -hmm. and the update tends, and it's not always the case, but tends to be small. So it's like not that huge, significant change to the structure of the racket. It's maybe some... Uh, change to the layup where they've added some foam or these uh, small things generally right and yeah. uh, then you can get the previous outgoing model for like half price so that's where you can do some bargains so if you you know usually models have two years i mean head does two years i think wilson sometimes two or three depending on the model uh bubble out there a bit takes a bit more time bubble for some reason they they usually wait like three or even more like for example we have a new pure strike coming this year coming year here 2024 Sweet. and the old pure strike uh, that's been around now since 2019 so this is a long one for rackets uh so i think soon you will be able to get really good deals on the pure strike the outgoing one for example so uh, that's a way to save money for very, very picky people, sometimes the new version is good enough to spend the extra money. Like there's enough of an update. That's why you might need to check out reviews and stuff, you know. And I usually keep like an extra version of the old model or whatever if I can, if I don't yeah, remember exactly yes. how it plays, to be able to compare and see, okay, is this going to be something that an average player, I mean, I might feel it, but if I test like hundreds of rackets, then it's a bit different than if someone just, oh, I don't feel anything, you know. <laughs> so... So yeah, that's, that's a good way to, to not have to spend so much money because I know now rackets are very expensive. Like they, they really upped the price on rackets now last year. So uh, you, you would want to find some bargain deal, especially if you want to buy more than one. Maybe you want three ones so you have, you know, two freshly strung or whatever. If you're a competitive player, then it's going to add up the money, right? So. Yeah, definitely. I think I saw the Pure Arrow at one point was like 300 if I'm not mistaken. And I mm -hmm. was like, wow, this is, <laughs> I've never seen this price before. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it is what it, excuse me, it is what it is. But, Jonas, this could be a very sensitive piece of information that maybe you don't want to give away. But how many rackets do you have right now? <laughs> no, not sensitive at all. Uh, I had, <laughs> like a while ago, I had like 100 uh okay. it's been fluctuating of course i sell a bunch to my like patreons yeah. and stuff i usually have like rackets for mm. sale there because like mm. i i can't keep them all like sometimes i mean over the years i've like oh i buy this model and then i get bored with it in like one week i'm like why did i buy this like it's stupid you know? <laughs> I, yeah I, I still do silly mistakes sadly i'm like oh i should switch to this let me get three of this one on some forum and then i'm like i'm using that two more weeks and then no i'm bored with it um, but I have like a, I think maybe now I have like 70 or 80, maybe something like that, but after okay. selling a bunch, you know, so it's been fluctuating a bit, but it, it's, it's way too many, you know, that that's the, mm -hmm. but I keep key models because I'm reviewing new ones. So for example, this year, I know which lines are being overall, which are being updated. And then I have the, the previous generation so I can actually, okay, string, string them up the same and compare and say, okay, is this anything? Cause I tr try to be like focused on the consumer. Is, the, is it worth for them to pay 300 euros or 300 dollars yeah. when the, the previous model was pretty much the same you know and in most cases it's maybe not so that's really you have to be very blunt about that and, and you know really compare them yeah it's, that's why people love your your channel jonas um i can just imagine you like you're like in the middle of the night you wake up to go to the bathroom and you're just like tripping on a racket you're like damn it <laughs> just with all the Could rackets happen. you have like i don't know why i just visualize that strange mind i have you know but um now i'm gonna ask you a very uh selfish uh question you know i'm an only child so a little bit selfish here but um and we, we i kind of uh talked to you about this earlier but so i play with a pure arrow vs 2017 i think it's like a pure storm mold is it um but uh yeah so i've been liking that a lot 
but for, and for me, like it's very important that I have a very spinny racket, um, one that helps me produce. I mean, obviously, we talk, you've talked about how like you have to have the technique for it, but um, it helps uh, accentuate that. And then you know, like power, like decent amount of power is, is good, not too much, not too little. Um, but the big thing for me, Jonas, is like I want more stability because then when I'm playing some of these like, these really good five O's and even five fives, like when they're like really whacking the ball, like sometimes I feel like it's I'm not as confident, like you know, with the connection, um, where, for example, I, I, I tested a, a previous generation V core and I could just feel that thing, like definitely a lot more stable, you know, it's like a thicker, um, frame as well. And then all the, on the volleys too, it felt more stable. So, um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, on what racket to use first off. And then I also have some demos coming up that I'll ask you about in a second, but like any thoughts on like what types of rackets you think i might like for that uh, to transition to it's a good question yeah i mean like that's the most common thing is that people really like a model it could even either be like outgoing like you can't find it anymore like you have to search forums and ebay i would usually be able to find it like at some mm. point even rare models because i have so many different sources for it yeah people i know that are in the racket business or whatever but um generally you might also want to change because maybe hey you know i want a bit more stability or there's something out there and when you're talking about the Aero VS, it's kind of like the 98 screen. So you're not going full power racket. You're going spin control okay. racket. So it's a spin control racket. And there's a bunch on the market, right? So, yeah. and if we take the V-Core 98, for example, it's a good option. The new V-Core 98 is very flexible. Like it has a lot of like pocketing. You might mm -hmm. like that. It's not okay. similar to what you are used to. But some people love it and some people don't. That's 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 one of those rackets that has had like a strong update. So the previous 2021 mm -hmm. one was firmer feeling, a little bit more similar to what you were used to, while mm -hmm. this one is is more flexible, a little bit more dampening overall. So you're not going to feel the ball quite as much, but it's also going to feel kind of pillowy. So that you might enjoy. Then the obvious choice is like Aero 98, Alcaraz, Rune, uh, Arthur Fields, so many good players using that. I have many like advanced pros here in south of spain where i'm playing like they they i bring lots of rackets they try it they're like oh i love this racket like that's one where people go wow you know that that's been one where, like it's a 98 but it gives you a lot of power a lot of spin mm -hmm. feeling is a bit more dampened than in this version than the previous generation i like it but there's also several guys i know that like the previous generation so it's a very much of a a matter of taste but you have to try the new aero 98 if you're in the search for that type of racket i think it's, it's a must so v core 98 aero 98 head extreme tour is a bit more control oriented i would say so might not give you all the power you need if you're hitting like if you're playing against really strong players the forgiveness is quite important like otherwise you, you're not going to get enough on your defensive shots when they start hitting hard right so Mm. Uh, I think that's the stability, the issue. And then obviously you can you can add weight to it. So adding, trying adding like two grams of lead tape, just bumping up the weight a bit, see if that helps when you when you are getting attacked or you you having like a strong hitter you're playing against. Yeah. Uh, but I will say arrow V core, uh, maybe extreme tour. Uh, those are like the most you know popular control spin rackets because you would like a spin racket, of course. Um, but I don't know, like it depends a little bit on the style. Like for example, some people like the ball to just have a more of a kick upwards. Yeah. Otherwise, like you can try a pure strike, for example, where you have a little bit more of a flat trajectory, but this very stable racket, right? It's very mm. stable that I'm referring. Uh, so, so those are some, some good options that I, I really thought like the Aero 98, very good update. I even like me, I'm a more of a, you know, flat hitting player. I like like really low powered frames. Mm -hmm. But I've been flirting with the Aero 100 this year because I, it's a racket I, I thought was very good. And they made the yeah. string pattern denser. So actually, the it control is. level aspect is much better than the previous generation. So in this case, I thought it was, a for me, a clear improvement, but not for everyone. Yeah, thanks for that, Jonas. Yeah, the, the Pure Aero 100 was, I really was very impressed by like the power but control like especially on the returns like i was really hammering the returns like I, I really enjoyed that aspect of it um but yeah it's it's yeah those are some great shout outs um some of them yeah some of them i've tried and like just not you know quite there maybe but um i might have to retry some of them i've been retrying things lately again but yeah i mean some other ones i was thinking of and actually i have a yonex uh percept 100 coming in i thought that might be interesting Mm -hmm. um and then i want to try a head speed mp but they didn't have that um in stock at the moment so i don't know those those what do you think of those choices you think those are 
like these may could be okay maybe definitely worth a try because those fall yeah. more in the in between they're like not in the spin category anymore doesn't mean okay. that you won't get spin with them okay but they're not like pure drive power yeah. or e-stone power so it's quite an interesting category that's growing where you have the forgiveness of a hundred square inch in the percept case but it is not as stiff as powerful it has a little bit more feel to it i really mm -hmm. like the percept hundred i think you you'll enjoy that one uh it also feels like it's a little bit faster through the air than maybe some other hundred square inch rackets i don't know exactly mm -hmm. know why i mean the beam the beam width is not as thick as you go uh, with an arrow for example uh, same for the speed. The beam is 23 millimeter instead of like a 26. So if you go for a power racket, a lot of them are 26 millimeters. That's a very thick beam. Some players can't play yeah, with that. Thick. They don't like that at all. Yeah. Some players uh, feel like, yeah, it, they feel more like it's more stable and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. it depends a little bit on the taste. But the speed is something I think most people should try just to kind of clear their head, you know, because it's like a, a bestseller for a reason. It has such a broad audience. Mm. I it's, I would not use it's not for me but it's like it, a lot of people like it you know it's one of those rackets you see all over and all over again so uh, worth worth testing those and see if that could work you know yeah no thanks Jonas and yeah I mean one one that I was like really wanted to fall in love with but again like it w didn't quite get there was the Selinka Whiteout 98 uh, the 16 by 19 like I I did like it I felt like it was like pretty whippy um but I felt like maybe I wasn't getting quite as much power like slightly not enough power that i would normally want to get but um have you i mean you've obviously tried that out did you gel with that one i did like it i also i mean since i test everything i get very picky right so yeah that's my problem i have, I have to kind of dial my own picky ego down a bit and and think of it as like who, are, who is this for who can it work for who has this type of style that this might benefit you know because most rackets today like if you go back 10 15 years you could have some real duds on the market. Like some rackets were mm. not thought through. They were too stiff. There were no, no dampening. But nowadays, the rackets are all good, but it's not might not be for you. So you might still have to go through like 15 rackets to find the one that you like, you know. But it, the, generally, they, like the quality is good. The feeling is quite good because they, they you know, been going so far in this kind of testing and they, they, they know what they're doing, you know. They have so much data built up now. And I did like the Solinko. Um, felt like the string bed was maybe a little bit lively for me, you know, yeah, for my game. Me too. Yeah, uh, so I couldn't really quite like. I, I'm very picky with the string out. bed, right? So if this, if this, I feel like I don't know what's going on with my shots. Yeah, I, 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 I need to feel like I'm making the mistake, not anything to do with the racket. I don't want to blame the racket for anything because I know <laughs> then it gets into my head and it's it's done, right? So right, right. Uh, and I, that's one of those frames that felt nice, but I didn't quite trust it. And that was my problem with it, you know, personally. But it's a good, yeah. good stick. Like if, if you like the feeling and and you feel like you can control the ball with it, then, then it's a great, great frame. Yeah. yeah, yeah, good stuff, good stuff. So one interesting frame that um, I, it was funny. Like I, I demoed it and I actually liked it. I thought it had a really good combination of of certain properties, but then you know a lot of spin, like pretty good power, uh, very maneuverable. But then I felt like my arm was gonna fall off. Um, and then maybe you already know which one it is, but, and then I actually saw a YouTuber, um, say like, this was one of the worst rackets like that has come out and whatnot, but I'm curious about your take on this one. Cause it seems like love and hate, like the Wilson shift. Uh, <laughs> what did you think about it? Yeah, that, I think it was very like a polarizing frame. If you look at other people, yeah. I talked to a lot of the guys who, who also test rackets uh, I try not to look at too many reviews, not get influenced, you know? Yeah, um, yeah, right. And I try to bring in other people on the review as well these days. So I try to always have like, Smart. okay, here's a few different guys with different styles. So we can all bring our opinions. I liked it. I thought it was very good. Uh, but some people struggle with the stiffness. I had no issues with stiffness. And I've had okay. like in the past, you know, if you're a play tester, you test a lot of rackets, your muscles never get used to you. Like your body is never used to what you're playing with, which is a bad Thing. you know you never build up that muscle mm -hmm. memory so the, the problem with the grip shape and the, the stiffness and everything starts being more magnified so you're, you're going to have some arm issues or wrist problems or whatever but i didn't have any problems with that i thought they played great they were a bit tricky to control because the, the whole thing is like this vertical bending that they talk about from the wilson uh, right. labs is that the the despite even the pro being 1820 which is quite dense pattern right and it's on a 99 square inch so it's not a huge head size this, yeah. The racket still plays like an arrow. It's like super spinny. So it's like <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's what I love. You know, I love that. 
and some people love that and and i, I think did. it's a it's a very good frame uh, and i if you haven't tried it i would i would try it you know because it's it's very spinny quite solid and it looks looks great it's just like an overall very solid frame it was one of those rackets i thought like okay for bringing a new racket to the market this was a clear thumbs up for me Mm, okay yeah well, maybe i just need to play around with the uh string and tension because like for some reason it was like harsh on my arm but um yeah yeah string yeah. I, I would say that like some rackets it might sound weird but some rackets are string sensitive so some rackets they work uh, really well with one type of string or one not like just one brand and one stuff like but but like a certain type of string doesn't really gel mm -hmm. with it or like mm -hmm. if you, you string them too high in the tension you go up to 55 pounds the racket gets kind of like too stiff and too much vibrations are happening. Mm. So sometimes it's about like dialing. When you found a racket you like, then you might have to dial in the string. Like maybe you have to go down in gauge, like a thinner gauge, or you have to have a thicker gauge. It depends really. Like, uh, But sometimes I also like, since there's so much out there and if you're able to test, if you don't gel with it, that like after, you know, two sessions and stuff like it's it might be too much work you know, for you to actually like this racket. I usually think that the the racket for you is one where you feel like, boom, after the first session, you're like, wow, I love this. And then you might have a time where you, it's like a relationship, right? Like you lose that, <laughs> oh, it's a little bit, it's not as sexy maybe after a few weeks. Right. But then you get back to that after a while, right? So you have to kind of get, go through those periods. But you need to have the, the love at first hit kind of thing as well yeah yeah that's right yeah you buy the racket some new strings and it's happy with you again so i was trying to make some sort of stupid comparison yeah, but yeah yeah no <laughs> like it, yeah. it's weird but i find like like i usually talk about something called the honeymoon period where you're like yeah. you're in love and you're like oh i can't this is every time i play with this racket i'm so happy but that will end at some point and harsh For reality sure. will set in and i i have this <laughs> i members on my patreon i talk to fellow tennis lovers all over the world every yeah. day and sometimes i get messages right. like oh uh, you know and they're like oh, it's the best racket i found the racket i found the string i'm playing my best tennis i just won three matches mm. two weeks later i get a message do you know where to buy this racket i'm like <laughs> you're, you're in love with the other racket this happened to me yesterday right so uh, <laughs> from a good player i know and he's like oh but now i want i want to buy this racket. i had some tough matches and then like you, you have three losses mm. or two losses and suddenly you're like throwing this racket. racket in the garbage bin <laughs> so it's, it's it's funny how how fickle that is yeah yeah gotta take some responsibility it's probably you, yourself not the racket yeah yeah. But, um, mirror, like, that's that's, the, that's, that's right. the thing that's right usually my, my mirror cracks when i look into it but it's another story anyways um in terms of like uh plush rackets jonas like um i think this is an important category because uh, a lot of our audience is like um, you know, 50 plus and like have de been dealing with injuries and whatnot. So what lines would you recommend to these players who just want that plush uh, pillowy feeling, as you mentioned before? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I think the clash is still one of those rackets. It's a hate love racket. Uh, it's also mm -hmm. one of those I think you should try, but like a lot of players like it for a good reason. It's, it's okay. soft on the arm and uh, it, it has like a nice give and it's like if you like the pocketing because it really pockets the ball it's like it's the, the ball stays a long time on the string people some people hate that some people love it that's mm -hmm. a little bit you know how it is it's not the easiest one to control always because that that you know pocketing on the string it results in like a trampoline effect so the the ball kind yeah. of sometimes trampolines a bit more than you had mm -hmm. imagined but for for a like you know recreational slightly older player maybe who has some arm issues clash should be on the demo list 100% then the rack is like, for example, the Prince Phantom series, very control oriented. Like you don't get quite as much power, but they're very nice on the arm and they're classy rackets. Um, a, a larger head size blade is another good one from Wilson that I think like I have a friend who used to play ATP tour uh, runs a club here mm -hmm. where I live and he switched and he still plays hits with futures players. Right. And he mm -hmm. switched to a blade 104. Oh, wow. And like Serena, that's right? a racket. Like I like that a lot as well. I played some good tennis yeah. with the 104 wow. and it's, it's very far from what I normally would play with. I play with a 95 usually, so 104 <laughs> is a different orbit. Uh, but that's a very good stick. So I think sometimes you have to have a pretty open mind and say, okay, I want this. You know, you can, you should probably look a little bit at the stiffness rating. Sometimes a high stiffness rating could be a problem, but it doesn't tell the whole mm. story. Okay. Uh, so bigger blade clash is good. Uh, bubble at rackets tend to be quite firm, so it's not the best brand. I mean, you, juniors love them. 
heavy hitting players love them. I do also love some Babolats, but for like a, you know an older guy, maybe with some arm issues or an older woman, I, I could be an issue. I would say. Uh, mm. without giving too much shade on to them right sure, sure. the head boom series is quite arm friendly i would say that you get yeah. some some extra uh so there's like lighter versions like boom team and stuff like that mm. uh, so that works pretty well just pretty flush feeling they have a little bit more give uh, so those those frames i would say from the the main manufacturers uh, there's there's some rackets that are not well known like a dunlop cx which is the control line from dunlop they mm. have an oversized racket called the dunlop cx 200 OS oversize and that's that's a great frame like a lot of players who had some arm issues love that one it gives them some control but it's very very nice feeling sensation and it's one of those like nobody talks about it you know so that that happens as well like there's some lines some rackets just fly under the radar and unless maybe a youtuber or someone talks about it it's like they don't sell them they are just not marketed at all so right that would be one of those Right, right, right. So a couple of follow-ups from that. First off, um, I remember trying the Dunlop. Is it the SX300? Um, is that the one? Yeah. I actually thought that was like pretty, it was pretty nice. Like it had it had a lot of the properties I liked. Um, maybe at the end, maybe I was hit, overhitting a bit too much with it. But um, what was your experience with that racket? Yeah, I liked it too. It was, uh, yeah. yeah, it was very powerful. Like I also noticed yeah. like I was overhitting. But I f it was very fast and whippy. And sometimes yeah. you love that. Like when you can really increase your swing speed and you just go for your shots like a maniac. That's yeah. super fun. You know, that that's sometimes the fun stuff of different rackets is that some days you just want that like super plush feel. You can play some drop shots, move into the net. You you, you play around with the ball. But sometimes you just want to whack the ball. Like you really want to like be like Rafa Nadal or Cal Alcaraz or whatever and go <laughs> crazy. And it depends on your mood a bit that day and how good your body feels and so on. So... The Essex was good. Uh, I struggled a bit with control. Uh, the okay. Essex 300 Tour, which is the 98 screen. Oh, the Tour. Yeah. 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 Sorry, that's that actually the one I weird. tried. Was that, was that, um, was that like better for you with the control? Like you like that more than this, the regular one? Yeah, I think I like that one a little bit more, uh, if I remember correctly. But I think I felt like at least the one I got because of quality control, you know, sometimes the weight and balance, they're, they're usually a little bit off within seven plus minus seven grams here and there. And that one I, I got was very light so i needed to add some weight to it, it felt like a bit too whippy like you had good speed but no stability like at some cases mm. but it depends a bit on the racket you actually hold in your hand so you might need to customize it a bit yeah that makes sense Jonas. in terms of like because one thing i'm concerned about like i guess it seems like a lot of the racket lines are going towards more dampening which i'm not sure if i'm going to like that there were some that i tried that i it was too dampened for me but how do you um do you counterbalance that with the different strings and then like you think it's possible to do that and then you'll like you'll like it like what's an example of like doing that if you think that's a feasible way of uh of making a racket that's more dampened like to your liking it's, it's a tough one because dampening is it's like a, it's a very strong matter of taste like some players can't play with dampened rackets i'm not a huge fan of dampened rackets always i try everything and i can play with everything now with with this this crazy tennis lifestyle but <laughs> It's tough to kind of, you know, remove the dampening feel. What you can do mm. sometimes is like have a hybrid, like a two different strings and have like a natural gut or some very touchy feely string uh, okay. and then a round poly in the crosses or something. So you, you, you kind of create like a bit more of a connected mm. feel like the gut. It has a very strong connection mm. and it obviously holds tension well and, and so on. But the dampening, which is sometimes like technology in the handle, I think Yonix yeah, maybe went a bit too far with the, the dampening of the recent rackets. Damn it. Uh, VDM, <laughs> actually, um, yeah. So, so in, some players love it. In, in terms of comfort, it's usually a good idea. But like some old school players who, who, you know, we have a racket maybe from 15, 20 years. Rackets were quite different than in terms of not like specifications, but in the terms of the dampening materials. Like I think what's what's the most modern thing I'm seeing now that I'm testing rackets that are not even out on the market yet is I'm seeing more and more dampening. I'm seeing like even more like of that. You don't quite like it feels good, but you're not sure where the ball is going 100 percent. Like so that's yeah. um, that's something we're seeing. And it's 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 not that easy, you know, to uh, if you don't like that, it's it's tough to kind of mitigate that feeling with the string. Yeah, just dampening my mood right now. Yeah. Sorry, that's a horrible <laughs> dad joke. I, I love puns. That was, that was so bad. Sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Th thanks for that. And then in terms of, um, so you mentioned updates, right? I think you said like Pure Strike was one of them. 
is there and you know obviously i don't know how much like insider knowledge you know probably the most out of anyone i've ever interviewed but like how um which update are you most excited about if any like and if any you could share if not no problem <laughs> yeah um i i think the new blade from my brief hit was was Ooh. very positive uh so i think that that was quite exciting did like the pure strike as well, but a little bit not like hundred percent my thing. But it's I only had like an hour or so with these rackets, so it's like it's it's hard to say hundred percent. But new models overall, like what I see from um, from my numbers and from people is that the brands that make people excited, there and the lines in in those brands, like it's like blades. Everybody loves a blade, so if a new blade comes out, yeah. people are gonna be excited. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Pure Strike is not the most exciting of the bubble up rackets, but since they only have three lines and it hasn't been updated in years, I think it's going to yeah. be pretty pretty interesting. And I think they are looking for some some other ambassadors now or like an extra ambassador because Dominic Team has not been like uh, super impressive of recent years due to injuries yeah. and so on. Yeah. So he's been struggling, and and it's they obviously Sad. want some young fresh face probably for it. So we'll see what happens there. Um, so so those lines are pretty exciting. There will be a new speed. Uh, that I've been testing as well, so people who love the speed line can wait for that. Uh, it's a little bit different than than the previous one. Um, so that, yeah, those those are the three ones that I think will, will create some some interest, you know, you know, in the in the market. And it's also something I know, like I want to put a bit more extra time to because like, people are just waiting for that. You know, like they there's so many players using these types of rackets that yeah. Oh, is the update worth it? Is one of the most common questions I get. Like, is it is it worth for me to spend? You know, if you have two rackets, six hundred bucks to get two other rackets. You know, two updated <laughs> rackets, and and it's not always the case that it's it's worth it. So, uh, you know, those I look forward to having more time with those frames. That would that would be would be good. Awesome, man. Awesome. Um, the blade, for example, like, uh, any big changes or like, you know, is it more maneuverable, spinny, or just yeah? I mean, I think you mentioned that one had the biggest change. Was it? Yeah, I felt that they they all have some they're all pretty slight changes for most people, I would say. Okay. Um, but but from from what I can tell, it's like it had like a positive, you know, felt a bit more solid, a little bit more power. Mm. Uh, I think people generally these days like a bit more power overall. I think that's where the game is going with uh, you know, the modern game is is even on the on the rec play, playing level, like the, people have a little bit more from the racket. The yeah. strings help the ball go in, even if they look like it's going out, you know, with the polyesters, uh, which is probably yeah. a bigger innovation than the rackets. So even on the rec level, like tennis is a bit faster, I would say. And and most people are using polyester, whether they should or not. So um, I think you, we're going to see a bit more dampened power overall, like, you know, more, better dampening, but also like trying to have a bit more power back. Uh, it ebbs and flows. Like sometimes it's like, oh, the trend is control. Then the trend goes to power. Then the trend goes to dampening. <laughs> then it kind of you know goes back and forth in circles. Yeah, gotcha, gotcha, John. In terms of the blade, because it's such a popular racket, I know a lot of players use that. My mixed doubles partner uses that, and I actually love. To be honest, I loved it. Like especially the eighteen twenty. Like oh man, my, for me, my volleys felt so amazing, and like the feel was incredible. But it just didn't. It wasn't quite like a spin. You know, it didn't have enough spin for me. Like even the sixteen nineteen. Um, but that one, yeah. I mean, how would you categorize that racket? Like, it, it wouldn't be a spin one. Would it be more control, I guess? The, the interesting thing with the blade is such a pop popular frame, but it's still one of those that is, like, I see a lot of people maybe who shouldn't be using the, the blade use the blade. And I, I, I yeah. think it's a great frame. Like, I, I've always loved right. it since they started releasing it. Like, it started with the M blade many, many years ago. Uh, yeah. And it's one of those lines that is popular for a reason. And a lot of pros use it because you get control and the pros need a lot of control usually. Mm -hmm. But for many players, they are not quite as forgiving and, and not spinny enough. I mean, for example, a 1619 blade is not a spin racket as you alluded to. It's a control frame, yeah. but it has a bit more forgiveness and a bit more spin potential than the 1820. Because when you have like 1820 is obviously more strings than 1619. So you're also going to have a heavier racket to swing with. That's good to keep in mind. Like if you're buying an 1820 version, it's not only more controlled and with a lower trajectory, but it's also going to have more strings, which means higher swing weight. Mm. Uh, so it's going to be more demanding to play with. The 1820 is always more demanding if you have two, two patterns to choose from. So uh, good to keep that in mind. But yeah, the blade is not like, uh, it's for you who are really um, like a modern control player. 
Mm-hmm. And I think sometimes you see blades in the hands of players that would benefit from even like, a, okay, if you want to stay blade, you go blade 104 or blade 100. Those are good, not super powerful, but a lot easier to play with than the 98. Because mm-hmm. a 98 is a control frame in today's market. That's just how it is. Yeah, true that, true that. Um, Jonas, what are your top three control rackets? Because we've talked about, well, we actually, we didn't do power either. But yeah, what are your top three control? And then maybe you can give us your top three power as well. Yeah, it's tough. Like, I, I think since I try everything, I mean, Blade is one of those, I would say that uh, modern rackets is like at the top, I would say. It's like that. That's the 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 one where, you know, most brands want to imitate. They want to have a Blade in their lineup. Like, yeah, uh, Radical is also there, similar okay. on par-ish, you know. Uh, so the Blade and Radical are best sellers for a reason. Other brands, they don't quite have like the blade and the radical in their lineup. They, they mean like the, you mentioned the Selinka Whiteout. That's a good one. Wouldn't be top three, maybe. Technifiber okay. TF40 is another mm. one where that's in that range where I, a racket I really like. Very good frame. Uh, that that's kind of like it's controlled. It's not as extreme as Prestige. Prestige and Pro stuff. That's like as controlled as you get. But I think mm. for most people, that's not the frame to get i would say unless you're like a connoisseur or you like the paint job or with pro staff 97 if we talk about that from wilson it's a 315 gram quite heavy racket Mm -hmm. small sweet spot very nice to play with if you're a good player but for most people i think the blade is the better choice because it helps you a bit more just a bit more you know so blade radical and then the third one yeah maybe would be the technifiber tf40 but just like off the cuff here i I did like the percept from yonex as well very good mm. frame, Percept 97. So, yeah, out of the, the three ones, I would probably go with those. Yeah, uh, that, That's Beautiful. a very nice choice. Even if it's 97, thanks to the isometric head shape, which is, you know, a bit flatter, it plays a bit bigger than that. Nice, nice, nice. Um, good, Great choices there. And they, for power, I'm going to guess one and say the pure drive. I don't know if, is that your, but it, but give me your top three, but I would just wanted to see you agree yeah that's, that's it has to be up there I, i'm not always super in love with I, I love older pure drives a bit more this is my personal yeah. taste i think it's a good racket i think a lot of people love the pure drive i have friends who play with it uh it was a bit firm for my liking i hope the new pure drive will will be a good one i'm really looking forward to testing that when that happens not exactly sure when that's going to happen sometimes the racket companies are very open with their like plans and you know i'm not sharing with my audience because i want to you know have a good relationship with them so we play ball if they want to have a planned campaign you don't want to ruin it for them i think that's a bit silly so oh for sure uh, sure. yeah but i I don't really know what that's coming out but the pure drive is good but my favorite is the e zone 100 Uh, it's a very good power frame i I, just my personal liking and the reason i think is the that it has a little bit denser pattern so on flatter shots, which a lot of people have flatter shots, you know, if like especially if you're you're been in the game for a while, it, it performs a bit better with control in aspect of control. So uh, so I really like the the East Zone hundred. That would be my favorite one. Pure Dove is up there in the top three for sure uh, somewhere okay. because it's a, still a good frame. Uh, just stiffness can be a bit of an issue where the Yonex is a bit more dampened. And uh, a little bit of a sleeper racket in the power category is the Dunlop FX five hundred. It's a very good frame. Uh, that I can recommend. So, I mean, Dunlop, they're, they're not like as well known as the Yonex head, mm-hmm. Pablo and Wilson, but they do make good rackets. So it should be on someone's list. Yeah. And the Ultra was pretty good as well. The Ultra V4 that they released, I think a year ago or so. So uh, that's that's probably four rackets. But that's like the, the big brands, they do make good products, especially these days. So like you're pretty, it's a pretty safe bet to go with a, like a name brand. I mean, I like to promote smaller brands because they make some good products, especially strings, whether it's rackets or, or apparel. But um, the, the big brands nowadays, they don't make like really like a super bad frame you're not gonna get that so if you want <laughs> if, if you know that it's like if you get a bubble up frame it's gonna be yes like a bubble up feel so if you for example you like bubble up rackets i'm sure you're gonna be happy with the new bubble up or same with wilson same with head you know that they still have their f- distinctive feel no matter what line of, of them you, you use right yeah i feel like for me in the end i might have to just do the <laughs> pierre 98 and just like get used to it for me it's like a little bit more I don't know if to say plasticky is right the word. Yeah, yeah. I think that's what I get from... uh, I think the people who don't like it, they've said that. That it feels like... Sometimes the funny thing with rackets is that just the cosmetic or just the feeling when you hold it in the hand makes a difference. So 
when you impact the ball, you might not look at like feel plastic, or whatever. It's not, but but, yeah, but it's yeah. just that whole experience with with the frame visually, touch and feel with the holding it in the hand. Maybe if you have, you have a one hander or two hander, uh, two hander. Two-hander, yeah. So, like for some people, like you just when you have a one-hander, for example, you you take the bracket back, holding it in the throat, and then if it, the throat oh. feels weird, mm. you can't hit your one-handed backhand. You know, so it's a small thing that actually plays a big role in the whole choice. So, yeah, I've heard that it's people. So maybe you should have tried the previous one, the VS, which is tough yeah. to find, but that that feels more, I would say, a little bit more like typical graphite. You know, shiny, mm. glossy finish. Not doesn't look so. Uh, I would, you know, you can talk about what you want, about the cosmetic of the new arrows. I, I, I could have imagined something better, but it's it's not horrible. But it's like it has a certain like younger demographic, you know. That's, right, right. That's good to keep in mind. Yeah, yeah, I definitely feel that. One one other thing about rackets. So you mentioned that, like the, you know, certain ratings, like let's say the stiffness, like it doesn't tell the whole story. I mean, one one aspect too that I was wanted to see to, if we could explain for viewers, um, you could explain is uh like the head, you know, headlights points, you know, head heavy, like the, the the points, like what does that correlate to, and does that also tell like the whole story about a particular um trait? Yeah, it's when we came, on the broad like line of specifications because I I think like when you people are browsing rackets on their favorite you know retailer website whatever yeah. they look at the specifications and they have head size that's how big the head size is that's not so complicated string yeah. pattern obviously you know sixteen eighteen quite open pattern fewer strings eighteen twenty denser pattern more control uh, those are pretty basic but when it comes to like weight and balance the balance point if it's head light it means like the racket head like the hoop of the racket doesn't, you know, it, it's the weight is more centered towards the handle. Like head light means that it's like handle heavy. So that can be a bit counterintuitive for some, I guess. But it's like, okay, it's lighter in the head than you when you balance the racket on your, your finger, for example. So if you get, like some players struggle with having too much weight in the head, mm -hmm. uh, like because it makes the racket swing slower. So one of the things that are affected by where the racket weight is placed is swing weight. And that's one of the most important things. I, I, I like to stress it a bit because I think the bracket brands don't put enough attention on it because swing weight is how heavy the racket is when you swing it through the air. And that's what's the most important factor when you, for example, want to have two identical rackets. So if weight and balance can be the same on three rackets, but they all have three different swing weights. So they all swing differently. So when you swing a racket through the air, that's where you want to have, oh, this feels the same like the, my other racket, you know? But if you buy two rackets without getting a matching service, which some retailers offer, they can feel completely different and play completely different. So with the balance and the weight, those are important. Um, but the swing weight, I would say, is the most important specification of the racket that you can look at, you know. And you can also adjust balance. So, for example, if you have a racket that's very that feels very heavy towards the head and you don't like it, you can actually add like something in the handle. It could be blue tack. It could be silicone, like mm -hmm. regular silicone you buy in like a hardware store. Or you can actually wrap like lead tape around the handle, the top of the handle maybe, uh, to get the weight more towards the handle. That's not going to affect the overall swing weight. And it's going to make the racket swing a bit faster. It feels a, feel a bit whippier if you like that. Nice. Opposite, if a racket feels very flimsy, like you're swinging it, feels like all the weight is in the handle. You can add weight in the hoop of the racket so it feels a little bit more solid and it gives you a bit more power and stability. Like sometimes I get rackets for tests even that are so off in specification that to even play the frame properly, uh, you, I need to do something to it. You know, I always try it as is, but I also then test it if I customize it a bit to where it would be more on the you know average specification. Jonas, uh, great stuff. So in terms of the the strings, um, I, I have a similar question for you as well as like the process, you know, part of it. So what what steps would you take to find the ideal string for your game? Yeah, that's also I mean, it always starts with with who you are. And I would say, like, if you're a player with arm issues, you should take this step quite seriously because the string makes a big difference. You can make a racket pretty comfortable, even if it's a relatively stiff racket, meaning like that when a stiff racket, you get rapid vibrations from the frame. It doesn't absorb the vibrations and it can go down to your arm and then you cause like tennis elbow in with kind of um, the easiest way to explain it. So 
a lot of players could benefit from playing with a multi-filament string. And a multi-filament is a soft string that has several filaments. That's from the name multi-filament. So it's like more mm -hmm. complex string that you can have in your racket pretty much until it breaks. Most players will not break a polyester string, which is the most common on the market these days. That's what most people use. But average recreational player will most likely not break it unless they hit like really off center or it has, mm -hmm. you know, the, there's like some part of the string hole grommet that is like a little bit sharp and then it, you know, snaps from that. Yeah. While pros who hit with a lot of spin and heavy speeds, they can break strings after one hour, you know, like they string a racket and it, they break in one practice. So they have to bring like four rackets to a practice, which sounds a little bit insane if you're not into tennis, but that's how it is, right? So for most for players with arm issues, I would definitely try to go for a multi-filament string. Uh, and there are many good ones on the market. Pay a little bit more, you're going to get better playability and feel overall. Technifiber makes some really good ones. Obviously, mm -hmm. the main brands, they do as well. Um, but a multi-filament, you can just play it until it breaks. While with a polyester, which is a firmer string, feels a bit more plasticky. There's loads of them, shaped, non-shaped, round, whatever. Uh, that one it starts to lose its elasticity after a certain playing period, depending on how hard you hit and how often you play and so on. Right. And when it loses its elasticity, you don't get the benefits of the string anymore. And the string is, is usually you call it dead. You can argue that it's not that it's, it's like, it's just too elastic or there are, you know, people have get very technical, but it, it starts to lose that sensation where the string snaps back into place. Cause that's what the poly does. It's like starts here, hit the ball, goes, like to the sides and then snaps back after the mm. impact of the ball and that's how the spin gets helps you so it's like if it's faster snap back the ball takes more of a shape from the racket and gets the extra rpms on the ball so mm. for spin players there's not really any option you need to play with a polyester string uh, okay. but there are soft polys there are stiff polys there are polys <laughs> that have a lot of give there are different colors the color makes a difference so you can have the same brand same <laughs> gauge which is the thickness and the one yellow and one black and the black plays a lot more control than the yellow one where the yellow one plays more lively so um there's a lot of things to take into consideration i would say like but arm issues is the most important part to uh, to consider and if you're a spin player yeah you would probably want a bit more of a control string because you're already playing with so much racket head speed while if you're yeah. a flat player you probably want to go with maybe a thinner gauge uh, and you don't have to have such a like super controlled string because you're already hitting it so flat. So you don't really need, need mm -hmm. that extra, you know, uh, snapback and so on. So there are a few, a lot of things to take into consideration, but those are some kind of key, key guidelines, I would say. Yeah. Super interesting stuff. Yeah. Cause I was going to ask you about, um, you know, if I were to switch from, um, from poly to multi-filament, like what, what, what would I experience? But it sounds like I would experience like less spin, um and then like maybe like more power like is there anything else yeah. no i think that the, the problem for a lot of players even i i try this uh, i i i usually everyone has my experiment kind of i'm like hey i give you a string if you're like maybe a, like a beginner and i if i have like beginners where well, there's like a group of players coming to marbella or whatever and i'm like okay try this racket and it's a multi-filament racket and it could be a player who has played mm -hmm. tennis maybe you know 50 times in their life or 30 times whatever it is you know mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people don't still like the multi-filament, even though it's better for them because it doesn't have the snapback. So it doesn't give you that nice extra spin potential. Uh, but it does give you power and it does give you comfort. So it, it does make the racket feel a bit more like a pillow, which some mm. people love, you know, and, and that's a nice sensation. And if you're unsure, you can always try to have one multi-filament in the mains, which is the main kind of string, or and one polyester in the crosses. So you get a bit of a mix of both worlds, something I sure. tend to go with a lot in certain rackets because I, I do like this, like the softer feel. You see a lot of pros use natural gut in the mains. You have Novak yeah. doing it, and my friend Roman Safiulin is now testing uh, oh. natural gut in his racket. So uh, cool. I talked to him yesterday about it. You know, so a lot of pros are more open to testing things now and and adding gut to get a bit more power, a bit more softer feeling, and so on. That's really cool. You're, you're friends with Sifulin. That's 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 awesome. Um, yeah. In terms of um, let's see the, the if you want to accentuate like, let's say you want to have more more um uh, spin and you're doing a hybrid. So should you put like that that string like the the poly in the main? Is it that whatever is in the main gives you more 
Okay. Yeah. Okay. I, I would put the, the poly in the main. Like I, that's also a, like I'm sometimes a matter of taste and style. Like Novak, for example, plays. I wouldn't say he plays flat, but he plays a lot more on the margins, right? So he he, yeah. he plays with very high tension uh, for mm. for most people, I would say, you know. And but he uses the gut in the mains because it kind of suits his style, which is a little bit flatter, more through the court. All his shots, if you you know, sometimes go to his practices. He lives in the same area as I do, so uh, they oh. every shot he hits looks like it's like five millimeters from the baseline. It's crazy you know, how you how you have this precision. <laughs> You can understand why he dominates sometimes because I, I've never seen anyone like just have that kind of depth control like that he has. It's just amazing. Mm. Uh, but he has the gut in the mains. But then you can have players who are maybe more spin oriented, but they want a softer feeling. They maybe put the gut in the crosses where it has a little bit less impact on the string bed. So mm. for you or if you're a top spin player and you want to try gut or you want to try a multi filament just to soften up the string bed a bit. Mm. Put it in the in the crosses, and uh, you get some of that benefit, but it, it's not the dominating string. The dominating string is the main string. Gotcha. Thanks, Jonas. Speaking of dominating strings, um, Hyper G seems to be one that is you know very prevalent, and uh, I think you know a lot of college players use it, and it's just yeah, I don't know. It's been very popular. I use it myself actually, but um, I guess first off, how would you categorize Hyper G? And then also, are there any alternatives that you have found as well that you think are can be quite good instead? Yeah, I'm a big fan of Hyper G, always uh, was since it came out. It's been like also one of those strings that capture people's attention because it's lime green, you know, like neon <laughs> green. So it stands out, which was yeah. a very smart move, I think, because like really you, you can see the string. It also works with different, I mean, I don't know how picky some people are, but if the racket is, is you know, yellow you can't have a yellow string it looks really strange right usually yeah. that's the, kind of the, the thing that you, unless mm -hmm. you love yellow uh but that string is is a is a spin oriented relatively firm i would say i would say medium firmness pretty firm string uh so arm issues you need to go very low i would not play with it with arm issues mm -hmm. there is hyper g soft which i played with yesterday mm -hmm. um and that that has a little bit softer feel but when you have a softer string it drops tension quicker and Hyper G yeah. soft is one of those strings that drop the tension. But Hyper G is a is a semi lively, like pretty. There's a lot of action going in the string. It has a nice like a snap back. It it gives you a lot of spin. Uh, if you like that feeling, it's it's a very addictive string to play with. It, I, I always liked it due to that. But there are like options. For example, Headlinks Tour mm. is is a string that is very similar, maybe a tad firmer depending on the col color way you go for. Uh, but it's one of my favorites. Uh, a lot of pros use that now, uh, making the switch to that string. That's also a great string. Uh, so those two strings have that kind of like firm, spinny feeling. Uh, if you want something, you know, that gives you some spin, but it's a little bit softer, like Yonex Polytor strings are pretty good. So there's the Polytor Rev, which is their spinnier string. That's a pretty good mm -hmm. one. Uh, that is not as stiff, you know. On the arm, mm -hmm. uh, so the choice of strings is like it's crazy now. Like it's hard <laughs> to keep up, even for me with my uh, weird uh, tennis lifestyle. Like I, it's tough to keep up with all the new strings hitting the market all the time and new brands, because the string market has us like it's an you know lower entry. You know that's like when you to develop a racket, that's a completely different ballpark. To develop a racket, it's going to require some money. It's going to require a lot of iteration, while a string is is easier. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, and then I do want to just uh, get into your podcast a, a little bit, at least. Um, uh, any particular guests that that come to mind and like really great pieces of advice that you've um, you know kind of taken with you from them? I've been fortunate enough to have some interesting guests. Uh, some of them are repeat guests, so I, I would probably single them out. You know, it's like I have Nikola Aracic, who's a yeah, Pretty he's famous great. YouTube coach, great guy, uh, loves tennis. I think his tennis uh, passion is is addictive, and we sometimes talk on the phone as well. And he's like, mm -hmm. we we can keep talking about tennis for hours. You know, it's it's pretty funny because he has such a wide knowledge, and some of yeah. his tips or ideas I are not always something I agree with, but I I always respect his opinion, and I think he's he's a lots of interesting ideas, and his his passion shines through, and he's a nice guy. So I would say like if you want to listen to those episode i think you'll find something you know well, once we did a four hour podcast whoa tired after that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i have a beer i think i that. published like two and a half hours of it because it had some technical stuff but it, it was yeah we can All talk right. about tennis it goes it goes nuts um probably awesome. bore people to death but and yeah. carousel it's a it's another friend of mine that we've he's been on my podcast twice good player now yeah. he's back on the tour so that's always interesting 
and he's very open. You know, I like people who are very open and honest and don't try to kind of hold back on certain topics. I, yeah. I always try to be as blunt without hurting people, kind of. You know, you want to be like you have nothing to hide, which is, I think, is a good way to live life. And he, he does it that way and, um, you know, understands tennis well and has his strong opinions. And uh, and it's interesting to hear his um, his thoughts about being a pro, for example. Like there's been some, even like an episode I did with Simon Konov from Top Tennis Training, uh, another nice. YouTuber. He, he talked about like the rough life on the pro tour. I think opened a lot of people's eyes on how, mm. like, you know, sleep in like a bus shelter and stuff like this while you're playing Futures. You know, that was Holy one crap. part of the episode. And... And then you realize, like, okay, life of a tennis pro wow. in the lower rungs of the tour is it's pretty tough, you know. It's a grind. Jesus. So uh, I, you know, kudos to people who really tough it out and and make it, or people who just try it, uh, because it does require like a lot of will to to go through that. Yeah, wow, that's rough. Yeah, I love love all those guys you mentioned. I've um, been lucky enough to make content with them as well. So um, very cool. Um, shoot, there's one one question I wanted to ask uh, about the racket brand, just to give a shout out, you know, um, to maybe like the, the most underrated racket brand, like a brand that, you know, isn't mentioned much, isn't in those top few that we've talked about, you know, most of the episode, but like that you, that you like. And you can mention multiple if you want. Yeah, usually you, you open up, pandora's box kind of no but it's like um yeah, <laughs> for example like a, a u.s-based brand that that nobody knows about but i, I actually liked a lot was the uh, fury brand like based in new york yeah. they're um, awesome i mean obviously all brands are you know most rackets are made in china like yonix excluded with the made in japan but uh, i would say that those rackets like the fury armor pro 98 my father still uses them i gave them to him i, I really like them too but he liked them more so and I have too many rackets, so I, I gave them to him, and he, he loves them. And he's, I, I force people who I play with to try rackets, you know, even against their will. I hold a gun. You know, <laughs> so what a savage! <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's usually because my bag is always like six to eight rackets, new rackets. Uh, and, yeah, and yeah, yeah. if I play with someone who's coming here to visit me in Spain, or, or just, I mean, sometimes it's tennis blind dates. May you probably have the same. Like tennis can be a blind date. You've never seen the guy. You just chatted, and then like, yeah, now you're playing, um, and that's nice. Yeah. And there always, there's always some racket. And some people are very reluctant to testing because they know, like, okay, I'm if I test, maybe I like it and I have to buy it. It's not good. So I <laughs> stick to mine. And yeah. then I don't push too hard. But the Fury is good. Um, and Gel makes some good rackets. I reviewed their React series. Oh. Uh, they're not that yeah. famous. And they also custom, like, so you can get your own specifications, which is pretty cool. They have a custom program. Uh, what else is there? There's a few brands that are, like, you know, Flying a little bit under the radar. I, I you mentioned Solinko is now famous for strings, but the rackets are are good as well. Yeah, uh, people don't know really know that they make rackets, which is interesting. Uh, True. You know, for example, like Technifiber, people don't think about, even though they're like Medvedev playing with it, Iga Swiatek, so many top pr pros like are using Technifiber. But when you ask a regular club player, you know they will know Babala Wilson. Uh, Yonex maybe now Yonex are are picking up steam and they and, are, yeah. uh, and head, but. There's so many brands that actually create really good products, so you can always look outside the the, the well-known brands as well. And you might find some. Maybe you want to be a guy who shows up with something that nobody else has. It's always fun, some, you know, to be that guy, right? That's right. Yeah, be unique, unique fellow. I I I remember when I was young, like I didn't want an Apple product, and I got some random one, and but it broke, and then I was like, damn, maybe I should have just got Apple. <laughs> but yeah. um. Yeah, as as a while ago, um, Jonas. Any uh, particular, uh, you know, just projects or like anything you want us to to check out that that you might be doing coming down the pike? I mean, I'm, there's always stuff happening. I'm yeah, m more stuff always on tennis nerd on that. So that's where the people can check out. Like, I, I we do more news now. I have a guy helping me a bit, like trying to do a bit more wide ranging content because. Even it sounds like I'm insane, but I, I also get bored with with the rackets, like because I need to do other. Uh, I I go to a lot of tournaments during the year, not a lot, but maybe five, six ATP tournaments during a year, and nice. I do like hanging around, like the watching a lot of tennis, talking tennis. Um, that's why I had the podcast. So I think yeah. people sometimes go like, "Oh yeah, this is the gear, dude." You know, it's gear, 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 and it's like, "Oh, it's nice to talk about something else than gear." I always like talking about gear, but it's like when it becomes your when a kind of a passion becomes your job, you always look for, you know, a little bit like, okay, it's good to get a breather from, from other stuff, mm. even if it's tennis. So, uh, yeah, tennis nerd on that is, is good to check out. Like if you want, please follow me on YouTube, trying to get the 50 K mark. I don't know the social media game well enough. Uh, I noticed that the younger guys do a much better job than I do. So, so it's tough to keep growing, but 
uh, I, you know, I'll do it because I, because I enjoy it. So that's really the, the thing, you know? Awesome, man. Do you also talk about like, um, how to improve your game as well? Like I, I forgot if you, you, were you an instructor at 1.2? Or no? I, we did uh, an app that's still around. Uh, me and Nikki. Nikki is a friend of mine who used to play pro uh, a oh. while back. And now he plays more football than tennis. But he's still a very good coach. So we did like an app with a lot of videos. He's been on my YouTube channel. A lot of people like Nikki. Nikki actually has, runs a, a company called Unstrong Custom where he paints rackets. So if you want your racket painted Ooh. in whatever idea you have, uh, he can get it done. He's done it for Elton John, for example. So he has some famous customers. But yeah. Um, but yeah, so it's that's that's cool, and we've done some coaching content together. You know, we we do play from time to time. He joins my reviews, but he's very picky about rackets, so he, he usually thinks it's shit until he starts playing <laughs> with it, and I, I can get to convince him. He's like, ah, oh, it's crap. I'm not gonna try it, and then okay. I force him. He's like, okay, well, it was actually quite good. I have to, <laughs> that's, you know, yeah, open his eyes. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. So yeah, so we have some coaching content. Like some, I sometimes help him coach. Like you know, I'm not a, a player can coach very good players, but I, you, I can coach like intermediate players, beginners. Sometimes we have people coming to Marbella and Spain and we I help out, you know, and try to I always like being on a tennis court, you know, it's something I, I always enjoy. I wouldn't be wanna be with, you know, students for eight hours, maybe. Okay. Uh because yeah, yeah. I want to play myself and and uh, get tennis my old body some exercise. But otherwise, uh, yeah, it's always fun to be on a court, whatever you do. Love it. Yeah. Hell yeah. I definitely agree with that. Um, and then any uh, social media I know you mentioned it, but like do you any profiles you want us to check out as well? Yeah, Instagram, I try to put like a lot of effort recently. Uh, seems like be like a platform where people commute. I don't know what's your experience there, but I, I, you know, when I look at different platforms, sometimes I gel more with some and not others. Like TikTok, I don't understand at all. Uh, mm. I, I've been open with that. Instagram, I like. It's more of a community feeling, you know, that seems to work pretty well. Yeah. Facebook, I feel it's like, for, it's, it feels like older people than me. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it's like it's not... Yeah, but I have the group that is going strong. So if you want to buy, sell, maybe you put that link in the show notes. Yeah. But like the easiest way to interact, where I get a lot of like advice, where some talk to some pros here and there, it's the Instagram. I think tennis nerd Insta, uh, where it's easiest to kind of reach out. I would say, for awesome. what's going on. Awesome, awesome, love it. Um, I think we could also talk for you know a couple more hours at least. But um, really enjoyed it, um, Jonas. I know you got stuff to do. So yeah, I'll just ask you um you know this question i ask all my guests which is and you can cater to to gear and whatnot if you want uh, you don't have to but what is one piece of advice that you can tell our audience to help them improve their tennis games oh yeah that has to be something with gear and uh yeah, yeah I, I would say that's one piece of advice it's a tough question actually I, I, give yeah. me four hours no 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 <laughs> i mean you can do multiple if you want we'll have to yeah do. yeah no i would i would say like <laughs> That for my audience, which something comes up all the time, I think it's it's pretty good good advice. Is try not to get stuck in the gear jungle. Like that's probably because a lot of people, you are in it now. I've been in it for fifteen years. I don't know. Uh, and it's <laughs> like if you can avoid it to start testing rackets, although it's fun, it's gonna be pretty detrimental to your tennis to keep testing. So I would mm -hmm. recommend you to try try to be like quite. Uh, strict with yourself maybe allow like okay i test four rackets i go for one and then i don't test any rackets for a year you know so put some strict guidelines this is very specific advice but i think if you really want to play good tennis getting into the racket game and the string game can be pretty detrimental although it's fun so i just wanted to give that warning out as a, kind of a last a little bit of a disclaimer like don't don't get stuck in it because it it, it can be quite addictive although it's not a, as bad as some things that are addictive it, it can be can be a long road yeah, exactly. Great stuff. So yeah, I mean, rewind, go, you know, listen again to like the process that Jonas outlined when we in the, yeah. more in the beginning of the show and, and and then pick it and then, you know, just use it for at least a few years. Um, great stuff. Well, everybody definitely check out um, net and then the YouTube channel, Instagram. We'll have all the links in the on the show notes page and in, in the app, whatever app you use to listen to the show. So uh, thank you very much, Jonas. Uh, appreciate the time and uh, hope to chat with you again soon and keep up the great work. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. And uh, yeah, I will keep listening. And if you have, uh, you want me on again, I'm here. So let me know. Awesome. Would love to do it. Thanks, man. Cool.